Hello, and welcome to the Verification Academy and the second session of our Advanced UVM course, Understanding the Factory and Configuration. I'm Tom Fitzpatrick, Strategic Verification Architect here at Siemens EDA. And in this session, we will show how tests can use the UVM factory and the configuration database to modify aspects of the test bench without having to rewrite the test bench code. Let's get started. In UVM, there are two basic customization mechanisms, the factory and the configuration database. The factory allows a test to change the type of a desired component or object, and it's set up at the start of simulation. Configuration, on the other hand, allows a parent to define properties for its children, so we can do that either at build time or at runtime. In UVM, every component is responsible for getting its own configuration information. We'll talk about what that means later in the session, but the point is that each UVM component can optionally use that information to configure its children. In System Verilog, when we instantiate an object, we have to construct it. So in System Verilog, that constructor is the function called new, and we provide the name of the component and a pointer to the parent. So in this particular case, we have a component of type myComp. We allocate it using the constructor, and we assign it to the handle at comp1. In UVM, instead of using the constructor, we use a method called create, which allows us to get an instance of that component from the factory. The factory is the thing that gives us this flexibility, as we'll see in a minute. So don't worry about the syntax of the double colons and things. There's a method associated with each type called create, and a thing that we will call a wrapper, which is what type ID is, that allows us to get this information out of the factory. So instead of calling the constructor, we call the create method. That gives us a different instance of my comp that we're going to call comp2. The advantage in using the factory is that it allows us to override the type of component that's going to get returned by the wrapper. So instead of a myComp, we're going to have a myXComp return. Notice that the environment code that's instantiating and creating COMP2 doesn't change at all. But the factory gives us the ability to return a different type of component extended from the same base type to put in its place. In order to be able to do this, we have to register objects with the factory and there are two macros that we use to do that. For objects, we use UVM object utils, and for components, we use UVM component utils. You'll notice that there's no semicolon used after these macros. The macro creates for us that wrapper type to register this thing with the factory to allow us now to use the create method and other things to access it from the factory. So the environment in the build phase will use the create call. The type ID here is the wrapper that gets created by the macro. And then the create method is actually a static method of the type ID wrapper that will return an instance of the appropriate type. There's no cast needed on the return here because it's guaranteed to be of the appropriate type. So we use static methods in the wrapper. Don't worry about the double colon. Just understand that you use type, colon, colon, type ID, colon, colon, create. And that's all you need to know in order to create a component of the appropriate type. From the test now, we have the opportunity to override the type of component that's going to get returned from the factory. So we use the set type override method, which is also a static method of the wrapper type, and it allows us to tell the factory to return an instance of that particular type. In this case, my XComp in place of the original base type that we asked for. So the environment code doesn't change, but the test now has the ability to override the type of component that gets returned from the factory. The getType method returns what we call a type handle, which is what we then use for the factory to know what type of object to return. So now instead of the original comp type, we get a myXComp return for the same instance in the environment, and the environment code doesn't change. We could also override a specific instance where in addition to the type, we specify the instance name that we're going to use to override. So here's an example of how all this works. In the test, we're going to create an instance of the environment. The environment is itself a component, so as we'll see, there are a number of cases where the environment will get configuration information and then use that to determine what to do with its children. In this case, the environment is simply going to instantiate two components of type shape, U1 and U2, and by default, these shapes are squares. We use the create method to create instance U1 and instance u2. So now we have two squares in our environment. From the test, we can override the type. So instead of a square, we're now going to return a circle. 
Notice that the environment code doesn't change, but now instead of two square types, we have two circle types for U1 and U2. So the set type override overrides all instances of a given type, in this case, U1 and U2. We can also override a specific instance using the set inst override method. With this method, we specify the type to be used and the instance name for it. So in this case, instance U2 in the environment is now going to be a triangle instead of a circle. When you're doing type overrides in the factory, the last override wins. So in this case, we've overridden the type of everything to be a circle. It's important to note, however, that instance overrides take precedence over type overrides. So in overriding the type for instance U2, we're forcing it to be a triangle instead of a circle. This would be the case regardless of the order in which we did these two particular factory override commands. We can also use parameterized types with the factory. If we have a parameterized type called, in this case, red, where the parameter is the number of sides, we register this with the factory as well using the component paramutals. There's also an object paramutals macro. And we specify the type and the parameterization in the macro to register it with the factory. So now we have a red parameterized component registered with the factory. In the environment here, we're going to instantiate the red component as instance U3 and specify that it has four sides. So the type that we use in the create call is the full parameterized type. So red count four. Other than that, it looks exactly the same. Type ID colon colon create. And this gives us U3, which is now a red square. From the test, we can also override this parameterized type. So we may have an extension of red, which is now blue, which by default uses the sides with the value of three, and that gets registered with the factory using the parameutals. Now in the test, we can override any instance of a red four-sided component to make it a blue four-sided component. So again, without changing the environment code, the test now allows us to have a blue square in place of the red square. Tests are also components, so they also get created from the factory. The thing is that tests don't themselves get instantiated anywhere. So from the top level module, we call this method called run test. Notice it's called with no arguments. The test gets registered with the factory. So run test will automatically create an instance of the test for us from the factory. And the type that gets returned is actually determined by the command line where you say plus UVM test name equals whatever the type of the test is. So in this case, we invoke the simulation with UVM test name equal test, and we will get an instance of a test class that will then instantiate the environment and so on. Note that the test name could be provided as a string argument to run test, and some find it useful to do this so that there is always a default test that gets run if you fail to specify a test on the command line. If you don't specify the test name on the command line, then you must specify it as an argument to run test or you'll get an error. It's up to you whether you prefer that to running a default test if you forget to specify the specific test you want on your command line. We recommend that you leave run test with no argument and use the command line to specify the particular test that you want to run each time. In either case, UVM will create an instance from the factory of the test class that matches the name you specify and then build its environment and so on. We can also use the factory for objects as well. So in the build phase of a test, we're going to instantiate the environment. And in the environment at the run phase, we're going to create an instance of a sequence of type myseq. Notice that we register the sequence with the factory using the UVM object utils macro. Now from the test, we can override the type of that sequence to be a different sequence that's extended from the same base type. And now without changing the environment code at runtime, when it creates an instance of the sequence, it will now give us an instance of myseq2 instead of myseq. The other useful way to pass customization information down the hierarchy is through the configuration database. The config database is explicitly typed, so you don't need to cast objects, and it is tied to the hierarchical scoping in UVM to make things easier to follow. So we may have a driver that has a parameter called x, and it may have a default value of 1. Then we might have an agent that instantiates the driver and sets the value of x using the config database to be 2. That will override the value specified in the driver, so now the value will be 2. When the environment instantiates the agent, it can set the value of the x parameter in the driver to be 3, and the test can also 
set that same value through the environment agent and driver to set the value of four. So at build time, the component that is highest in the hierarchy will be the value that gets used. Note that we're using set and get calls here to affect the value of the driver. Since components get built top down on UVM, we can't actually set the value of e.a.d.x from the test's build phase method since the driver doesn't exist yet. But using the config database, we can set the value that we want to use and then the driver will get that value once it's actually been created. So if we look at the path from all the way down inside the driver, we set x directly to be 1, and from the test we're reaching down through the environment, the agent and the driver, to set the value at 4. Since the test is the highest component in the hierarchy, that's the value that we're going to use when the driver actually gets the value out of the database. Usually in UVM, the first thing that each component will do in its build phase is to get configuration from the configuration database. Usually this may be a simple getting of an integer or something, but a lot of times it will get an object that includes all of the configuration information that the component may need. And then we can use a piece of that information to set the value for something below it. So in this case, the environment is getting the value of Y from the configuration database and using that value to set the value of Y inside the agent. The agent similarly is getting the value of Y and using that value to set the value of the driver. This allows us now from the test to pass that value to the environment. And the environment uses that to pass it down to the agent and the agent uses that to pass it down to the driver. We do it this way to improve reusability so that the test only worries about setting the Y value of the environment and then it doesn't really care what happens after that. In this case, we're passing it all the way down to the driver, but in a different environment, we may use the Y parameter for something different. But as far as the test is concerned, it's just setting the value of Y in the environment. So when we use the config database, we specify UVM config DB and parameterize it by the type of the value that we're setting. And the set call, the first argument is always this, which is the component that is making the call. We use that to determine where we are in the hierarchy, and then we specify the instance name of the component that we actually want to set relative to the component doing the set. So we wind up basically taking the full name of the calling component and append that with the instance name to get a full path to the component that we want to configure. Then we also append the field name, which is a string for the name of the parameter that we're setting, and then we pass in the value. On the get side, we again use this, which is the component that's calling the get, so we know where we are in the hierarchy, and we append the instance name to get the full path name to the getting instance. Usually the instance path will be the empty string, since the this pointer will have the full path name to the getting instance. As long as that path matches the path from the set call, we're going to use that information. Then if the field name is the same, we get that value from the database and return it. Because the config database call is parameterized by the type of the value that's being returned, we don't have to cast the return value from the get call. So because it's linked to the component hierarchy, we now have the ability to set and get values from anywhere in the hierarchy. Also, the config database allows us to get information from any element, whether it's a component or a sequence or an object. As long as the name and the instance name match, you can set and get values for anything in UVM. One of the useful things about the config database is that it allows us to pass virtual interface handles from the top level module down to the test and down further into the environment and the driver. So at the top level in that initial block, we will use the config database parameterized by the type of virtual interface that we're going to set. You'll notice that the this pointer is null because we're not actually in a class. And then we specify the path to the top level test instance. In UVM, the top level test instance is always UVM test top. We use the field name AHB, and then we pass it in the interface that we instantiated in our top level module. Now in the test, in the build phase, we will get the configuration information from the database. The get call is parameterized by the virtual interface type, and it uses the this pointer, which is a pointer to the test, UVM test top. There's no instance name necessary because that's incorporated in the this pointer. We specify AHB, which is the field name that we want to use, and then the value of the desired field is returned in the last argument. 
In this example, we're going to use the AHB virtual interface as one piece of information we'll use to configure our AHB-based components. So as a convenience, we're going to pass the return value of the virtual interface directly into the AHB config object, which we'll pass down hierarchically, as we'll see. The return value of the get call is a 1 if the get is successful and a 0 if it's not. So we put the whole thing in an if statement and issue an error if the get call fails. Our environment is going to be configured using the env config object, which we create from the factory. The environment config object will include, among other things, the AHB config object. So after setting up the AHB config, we assign that to the environment config object, and then we call uvm config db set to pass the environment config down the hierarchy. The instance name supports pattern matching using either glob style or regular expressions. So in this example, any instance that is looking for an item in the config database called config that is of type env config will be able to get our environment config object. It is important to note that the config db can have a substantial impact on performance, so we recommend that you try to be as efficient as possible. Using wildcards in the path expression is particularly expensive. We recommend that you use config objects as much as possible and minimize the number of set and get calls that you use. For example, since all agents have the same API and the same basic structure, you could use a config db get call in your agent to get a configuration object that has everything the driver and monitor need as well, and then have the agent set those fields directly after the driver and monitor have been built. So to summarize, we use the UVM object and component utils macros to register with the factory. We always call the type colon colon type ID colon colon create. And again, you don't have to worry about what this means. You just need to know that this is the idiom that we use to create an instance of an object in UVM. We register tests and every component with the factory. So tests also come from the factory. And we can specify on the command line which test we want to run by calling run test with no arguments in the top level module. And then that gets filled in from the command line. At build time, we can use the configuration database so that every component can get its configuration from the database, such as information from its parent, and use that before configuring its children. In UVM, everything gets built top down, so we start at the test, go to the environment, the agent, etc., and the highest component in the hierarchy will win. That's the value that we'll use. You can also use the configuration database at runtime. So if you have say a driver that is executing a state machine to interact with the bus, every time it gets back up to the idle cycle, for example, that may be a time when it might want to get from the configuration database information about how many wait cycles to inject or something like that. So it's up to the getter to decide when it's legal to get that information. You don't want the test to reach down in and tell the driver to inject a different number of wait states when the driver is in the middle of executing a bus cycle. So it's up to the driver in this case to know when it's legal to update that value and to get it from the configuration database. That allows the test to change the value in the database at any time, but the value will only actually get changed in the driver when it's legal to do so. So a configuration database can be used at build time to set up things like how many components should be on the bus, or at runtime to determine things like what percentage of errors should be injected, or how many wait states to inject, things like that. Of course, as we said, the configuration database can have a negative impact on your performance, so we recommend using it as efficiently as possible. That concludes this session on customization in UVM. Thank you very much for your attention, and please stay tuned for session three on modeling transactions.